Welcome to another Foldit lab report. I am BKEP here with my colleague Ian H. We just managed to pop into lab for a quick video shoot, but we are still trying to work from home as much as possible. If this is your first time discovering these lab reports, we put out these videos on the first of every month to tell you more about the science that happens behind the scenes at Foldit. We wanna start this month by talking about our influenza binder design competition. Congratulations to our winner, Loki Oiling, who submitted 43 designs for this competition. Uh, we also wanna thank all of the participants that made this competition a success. To recap, this competition was an experiment meant to encourage Foldit players to make the greatest number of quality protein designs rather than focus on a single highest scoring protein design, like in normal puzzles. Our goal here is to make Foldit more effective for protein design research. Foldit research is currently limited by throughput, or the number of designs that Foldit players make. We're not so much limited by the quality of our top scoring solutions. The thing is, optimizing for a really high score is good for protein prediction problems, but it's not necessarily applicable to protein design. There are times when a higher score is not necessarily better. This competition was set up to answer two big questions. One, does this competition reward system actually increase design throughput? And two, do proteins designed in this competition still meet our quality standards? Let's start with question number two. Are the designs from the competition still high quality designs? Yes, the 242 designs submitted in the competition look just as promising as designs from regular Foldit puzzles. This makes sense. We set a score threshold as part of the competition to ensure that only excellent designs were valid submissions. You needed at least 10,000 points to enter a submission into the competition. Now, I want to be clear, 10,000 points is a very high bar for this kind of puzzle. To reach this level, you probably have to be a very experienced Foldit player, or at least have been playing for a few months. And by the way, bravo to our youngest competition participant, AKA AKA, who only joined Foldit last September. I also wanna point out that many of the solutions below our 10,000 point threshold are still scientifically valuable. They will still be considered in our analysis as possible candidates for lab testing. This 10,000 point threshold is not supposed to be a cutoff for scientifically valuable work. Rather, we think solutions past 10,000 points are probably good enough, and a Foldit player could contribute more to research by making a whole new unique solution. So the quality of competition solutions looks good, but did the competition actually increase design throughput? Yes, during the competition, the Foldit community created quality designs at almost triple the rate of a normal Foldit puzzle. This is awesome. By contrast, in a similar puzzle that did not use the competition format, we saw about 43 unique solutions. In the competition, we saw 2.8 times that. This shows that the Foldit community does have the capacity for greater design throughput. In fact, we'd like to see it go even higher. Later on in this video, we'll look at some of the designs submitted by the competition winner, Loki Oiling. We'll also discuss some other ways that we might improve design throughput going forward. But first, Let's go through some puzzle updates for March. In the puzzle menu this month, we saw all kinds of protein folding problems. We had some metric design puzzles where we are trying to design a protein that will associate with other copies of itself in a symmetric assembly. We saw two-sided interface design puzzles where we're trying to design a pair of proteins that will associate together. We had a designable linker puzzle where we're trying to link two different proteins by designing a rigid folded linker between them. We've also seen an exciting increase in electron density puzzles. In these puzzles, we're trying to fold up an existing protein starting from an extended chain. But unlike normal prediction puzzles, we have real experimental data that shows us the shape that the protein will fold into. This information comes to us in the form of an electron density map. Interpreting this kind of map can be a challenge for automated computer programs especially for low resolution, blobby looking maps. In fact, even professional crystallographers and microscopists can have difficulty folding a protein into one of these maps. This seems to be a problem well suited towards the skills of Foldit players, and I think we'll see more puzzles like this in the future. Lastly, we had a slew of protein binder design puzzles. In these puzzles, we are trying to design a protein 
that will stick to a target protein. These kinds of puzzles could speed up the discovery of new medicines, including antiviral drugs. A protein binder that successfully locks onto a viral target could block viral infection. And these kinds of puzzles are especially exciting because in the lab, we can run experiments to test tens of thousands of designs at a time. In fact, the main problem for binder design right now in Foldit is design throughput. And this was the major motivation for the protein binder design competition that we talked about at the beginning of this video. So for design of the month this month, let's take a look at some of the winning solutions from our competition champion, Loki Oiling. Okay, so here we have the first solution submitted by Loki Oiling for our competition. We see a very stable looking three helix bundle with a strong hydrophobic core full of orange side chains and lots of blue polar side chains on the surface. So this looks like a protein that is probably likely to fold. There are lots of orange hydrophobics at the interface, which should make for good, tight binding. And we even see, I think, some nice hydrogen bonding with residues on the target surface. Yes, so let's see if we can zoom in there. Um, um, so we do have some, some nice hydrogen bonding with the target, especially this buried tryptophan down here. Um, and that should cut down on the number of bonds that would form otherwise. Remember, if loci did not make hydrogen bonds with these side chains, they would be buried unsatisfied polars, and that would be very unstable for binding. It does look like we may have some polar atoms on this end of the protein that are not making hydrogen bonds, and that could be a problem for this binder design. But by and large, this looks like an excellent binder design from Loci. Let's take a look at another from Loci. Okay, in this second design, we see another three helix bundle. Again, looks a very stable, strong hydrophobic core with blue polar residues on the outside. We do see in this solution, it looks like there are a large number of big orange hydrophobic residues at the interface here. So if we zoom in, I count one, two, three tryptophans on our binder here that make contacts with the protein target. So that's good and it should make very tight binding. These are large hydrophobic side chains with lots of hydrophobic surface area that will make for tight binding. But including this many large hydrophobics on the surface of a protein can also be dangerous. That could make this protein more likely to aggregate or to stick to lots of things in the cell uh, and not just this designed intended target. Um, but otherwise, we do see uh, some very nice, um, looks like some hydrogen bonding here with the target to, to help cut down on the number of bonds. Um, we may still have some polar atoms on this other side of the target. Let's see if the bonds, uh, the bonds objective does not actually flag those. So maybe those are okay. Maybe solvent Maybe there's enough room for solvent to get in and make hydrogen bonds with these polar residues on the target. Again, this looks like a, uh, a very nice design we have from Loci. Let's take a look at one more. And in this third solution from Loci, we have yet another three helix bundle. Looks like at about the same location on the influenza target. Just like the other designs, mostly a, a strong hydrophobic core with blue residues on the outside, so it looks good for binding. We do see uh, fewer of these large aromatic and hydrophobic residues on the surface, so maybe maybe this protein would be less prone to aggregation. Here's a, another tyrosine, but it looks partially buried, and it makes good hydrogen bonds. Look at that. Um, I do notice that this design seems to have a histidine in the core. And this histidine, let's see if we can look at side chains. So this histidine is making a hydrogen bond uh, with this other aspartate, so that's good. But the histidine has a hydrogen bond acceptor on the other side, which is not making any hydrogen bonds. So this nitrogen, this histidine nitrogen that is buried in the core 
and is not making any hydrogen bonds worries me just a little bit. Uh, that could prevent this protein from folding up into the correct shape. These hydrogen bonds between the binder and the target will not necessarily improve the tightness of binding, but they prevent buns, which are bad. When we pack our binder against a target that has polar residues, we need to be very, very careful about creating buns. And the only way to avoid that is to satisfy those residues by making hydrogen bonds. And Loci seems to be doing a pretty good job of that. So maybe you noticed that all of these designs from Loci seem to be similar looking three helix bundles in about the same location on the target. The three designs we all looked at were unique and they did have very different sequences, but there were cases we saw in the competition where players could restart the puzzle and develop solutions that were almost identical to one another, completely independently. So while that does give you more valid submissions for a competition, that doesn't produce additional unique designs that we can test in the lab. With this in mind, I would encourage you when playing design puzzles to think about the diversity of solutions that you submit. Every time you reset the puzzle, that could be a chance to try a new fold or maybe a slightly different location on the binding target. At the end of the day, we want to maximize the diversity of designs that we can test in the lab because that will give us the best chance for finding a design that successfully binds to the target. That's all we have for this video. In April, you can look forward to office hours with two of our Foldit developers, JFlat06 and Milkshake. As always, thanks for watching, thanks for playing, and we'll see you next time.